our culture is energy blind in the sense that we look at our daily lives and we measure things in money or technology and we don't recognize the uh, ubiquity and power of energy in our everyday lives. Um, so until 10,000 years ago, humans lived in small tribes in Africa. We didn't have possessions really. So once the climate warmed and stabilized, we started to do agriculture in place. And so we started to maximize the amount of surplus we got instead of minimize our time. Like back in the day, hunter gatherers would only work 10 or 15 hours a week gaining food. But then we switched in a huge way and that kind of changed everything. Energy is so important in nature. Energy could be argued to be the currency of life because if you are like a cheetah and you spend calories chasing a gazelle, you need to get uh, an investment payoff uh, the calories in the gazelle, mm. uh, and those cheetahs, those biological organisms that have a surplus of energy received versus the energy they invested have an evolutionary advantage. Uh, they have more energy available for their metabolism, for reproduction, for raising their offspring, et cetera. I, I, I remember watching Many times, I love cheetahs. I mean, I think a lot of kids love cheetahs, the fastest land mammal, you know, like we get all excited about it and they're on a chase, they're on a hunt, and then they don't get what they're after. They mm -hmm. don't get the gazelle. The gazelles are fast as hell too, and so sometimes they get away. And then you just see the cheetah panting, and then you have some David Attenborough character being like, well, that was a bad one. If he gets a couple more of those, he might not make it through this drought. You know what I mean? And, and you start to, that was, I guess, my first understanding of like, oh man, this is a high risk game. You spend that much energy ramping up to 70 miles an hour trying to catch this gazelle. The gazelle gets away. You may only get a couple more shots, a couple more sprints before your energy starts to deplete. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I'm a little older than you, but I would. my favorite show growing up was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like mm -hmm. on Sunday nights, you mm -hmm. would see Marlon Perkins talk about the cheetah and the gazelle or whatever else. And to this day, that's what motivates my work is the – 10 million or so other species that we share the planet with because everything is connected and we've also lost sight of that. Uh, um, and we can talk about that if you want. But getting back to the energy thing, humans then started to transform and expand around the world because we had surplus. We would grow more food than we could eat. And so then we had warriors and accountants and priests and uh, different vocations because we didn't need – uh, um, we had more food than we needed to, at the moment. Fast forward. And you had a ner you had a term for that. And I just want to get that clear. It's like, that was like interiorly kinetic energy. And then there was like exokinetic uh, energy. Right. So animals consume energy like a cheetah will eat a gazelle yeah. and the, the, the meat will be transformed in the body endosomatically. Endosomatically. Yeah. So humans now we, uh, you and I eat, uh, 2,500 calories a day or something like that. The average American consumes 2,000 calories of kilocalories of food per day. Mm -hmm. Actually, we use 3,500 calories, but a lot of it's wasted. But in the body, we consume 2,000, 2,200 kilocalories a day, but we consume 100 times that. We consume 215,000 kilocalories a day with the lights and the shopping centers and the embodied energy in these materials. Everything in this room required energy. So exosomatically, outside of our bodies, humans today are waving this magic wand of excess energy use beyond what our bodies need to survive based on our infrastructure and our, our modes of, of consumption and supply chains. Yeah, so the, so the first energy boom was increasing the surplus of endosomatic energy, which was just available food. Yep. And then the second big boom, and that, and that got a lot of shit done. Yep. I mean, we're talking civilizations were built. Yes. Because of that, you know. And then the second big boom was this exosomatic energy when we started to be able to harvest energy and create technological energy. Well, we, we could create technology for many millennia and centuries using the natural flows of the earth. Uh, we would chop down trees or build uh, harnesses for oxen 
And, and do, the trees would provide warmth, which is another form of energy, right? It, everything in our economies and everything in our past uh, economies requires energy to uh, invent, to mine, to create, to deliver, to maintain, to repair when it's broken, and to dispose of. There's energy used at every single stage. And the reason that you and I are talking about this, um, because it's becoming aware to people in the world that, my God, we might have a little bit of an energy issue. And since you and I have been alive, we've had more energy every single year as a global culture Every single year, with the exception of 2020, which was COVID, 2009, the financial crisis, and a couple years in the 1970s. Um, but, but let's get back to the, the grand arc. Mm -hmm. So um, we, uh, in 17th century, 18th century, Europe was getting up against the maximum levels of what uh, they could support with the hydrological flows of farming and so draft like animals. They had windmills. They had you know sluices that would take river water and turn wheels. They had some ways. They to had harness. some ways. They had some ways to harness nature. But then, when trees were starting to, um, they were starting to run out of trees for timber and fuel in England. And then we puzzled out how to vertically farm, which is to drill under the earth and pull out uh, fossil deposits of ores and energy. So that began the industrial age where we apply thousands of units of energy that is from underground to replace things that humans used to do manually or with draft animals mm -hmm. at a fraction of the cost. So um, since then, since the mid 1800s to now, we've been on this explosion of economic growth and we assume that it's due to technology. Technology does amazing things for us, but technology is mostly a vector for accessing this incredibly powerful fossil sunlight, which we are extracting now in the form, form of coal, oil, and natural gas, 10 million times faster than it was trickle charged by daily photosynthesis. I mean, just to point out what oil is, oil is found in regions that were ancient oceans in the earth. And the algae, the phytoplankton, that are photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, they, uh, they grow from the sun and then they die and they fall to the bottom of the ocean. And over tens of millions of years, they're compressed and geology changes and it turns into oil. And it so happens, especially where you live, but our entire nation is one of the most geologically uh, rich areas in the world. Um, you know, we uh, have used more oil, coal, and natural gas in the United States than any other country in the last 20 years, in the last 50 years since the dawn of time. A barrel of oil, Aubrey, has 1,700 kilowatt hours worth of energy potential stored in it. You or I, digging ditches, hauling wheelbarrows, chopping wood, working for nine hours a day generate around six tenths of one kilowatt hour. You're pretty <laughs> fit and strong. You probably do a little bit more than that, but pretty much one you, whole, one whole kilowatt. Hour. Okay. Let's, all right. Let's all right. be real. One here. whole kilowatt hour. But if you, if you compare that to <laughs> what is in a barrel of oil that we pay $90 for, yeah, it would do four and a half years of yours or my work. Wow. And we pay $90 for that. So the average American uses 17 of those barrels of oil per year and another 40 barrel of oil equivalents of gas and coal. So we use 57 barrels of oil worth of work from, and we're paying pennies for it. Mm -hmm. And there are barrels of oil that are being burnt in factories in China to create products that we import. That's another 17 barrels. So the average American consumes 72 barrels of oil per year. This stuff is on human timescales indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. So globally, think about this. Globally, we use 100 billion barrel of oil equivalents of fossil energy every year in the global economy. And each one of those barrels is worth around four and a half years of human work. 
So in addition to the 5 billion real human workers, we have around 500 billion fossil workers that are doing work for us, heavy lifting, machinery, transport across oceans in the sky. Um, and we all take that for granted because we just pay for the cost of extraction plus a little profit for the oil company, not the cost of creation nor the cost of pollution. Mm. So our culture ignores this fundamental reality that our lifestyles and our expectations are fully dependent on a finite and depleting fossil resource. Um, we are becoming aware culturally in the media and in our looking at everyday reality that the pollution from fossil fuels is creating a problem. Mm -hmm. Climate change, ocean acidification, things like that. But I think our culture has yet to have a conversation about, wow, what, hap what do we do once this stuff starts to decline every year instead of going up every year. And that's starting to happen, right? It's costing more energy to access less available energy. Like we're having to dig deeper, deep water wells. We're having to frack for natural gas. We're having to push harder with more energy to get relatively less energy than it used to be maybe 50 years ago, right? That's exactly right. Um, so I wrote my PhD thesis on the concept of net energy, which is measuring the cost of energy, not in dollar terms, but in energy and resource terms. And so it takes energy to get energy out. And the more energy that we have to allocate to the energy sector itself, the less is available for Disneyland and hospitals and shopping centers and universities. And that's happening now. Don't um, take away the log jammer. That's all I'm saying, man. I don't know what the log jammer is. You've never is. been to the log jammer? No. <laughs> Wait, is that from the dude? Is it is it the Matterhorn? The log jammer is another ride in Disney. The, the log jammer. It's a water ride. It's a water ride. Okay. You go through and everybody gets splashed at the end. I was Pirates of the Caribbean is all Pirates I remember. Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. is good. Um, they gotta stay in this new world we're building. I understand. We have to make some we have to make some cuts. All I'm saying is the log jammer is one of the last to go. Your vote is noted, <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted that recorded. But you bring up a point, and uh, in, I haven't laid out the logic yet of why this is happening, but you've, your point is that we're going to have to make choices because we can't probably have access to a growing amount of energy in the future because we're spending so much of it, and not just energy, but also materials like copper uh, and fossil water aquifers, we're running into limits. Um, so just talk about oil for a second. The United States has more oil wells drilled in our country than the rest of the world combined. It's like a pin cushion. Mm. And we are one of the top three oil producers in the world with Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, but I would argue that we've used the best first. We've effectively drained America first. And oil production peaked in the United States in 1970, and then had a 40 year decline. And then we'd started to frack and we accessed oil at the source. The source rock is light tight oil or shale oil. It's very expensive. It depletes very rapidly. There's a lot of it left, but it's there's nothing left after that. Mm -hmm. So right now in the United States, if we were to stop drilling, for environmental reasons, for affordability reasons, for recession reasons, our oil production would decline 40% in the first year and another 25% the second year and another 20% after that because the pressure and the, the, the oil dynamics, these wells deplete 80% in the first year and a half. Mm. And so we have to keep drilling in order to maintain our production. But I would argue that the world hit its all-time maximum of oil production in 2018, uh, in November. And part of that could be due to COVID, but the underlying decline rate of all the wells in the world, in all the countries of the world, is around 6%. So that means that all the wells drilled before this year are declining on average at 6% of their production every year. And so we have to invest in more new wells um, or develop new technology and find new fields to offset that decline. 
Yeah. So one thing, just want to double click on the idea of us being energy blind, because mm-hmm. this is fairly obvious information, actually, when you receive it. It's like, oh, yeah, but very few of us are actually thinking about it in these terms. Energy, as you said, seems ubiquitous. Maybe it costs a little more. Ah, shit, it's a little bit more at the pumps, you know, and sometimes that stings worse than others, depending on your financial situation. And, you know, I have all the compassion for those who have to make already tough decisions based upon the price at the pump, which is happening and has been happening as gas prices rise and, you know, different energy costs rise. But, you know, fundamentally, as we reveal the truth and unveil our own blindness, then we start to see, oh, shit, we have a problem. There's a finite resource and we are going to hit it. It's a matter of when. And sure, there's some availability for certain innovations and different ways that we access coal or oil or gas or find you know ways to dig deeper in the ocean, all with its own environmental cost and risk of spills. And there's all kinds of different tangential issues related to that. But fundamentally, we're going to run out. Like that's that's the bottom line. So we either need to find a way to replace that energy with something else, this kind of mythical unicorn of clean energy that comes from some other thing that we've been trying to work on. And I think nuclear energy was that first big moment of like, aha, we found this, we found this other source. So we're either going to have to replace it or we're going to have to dramatically change our lifestyles or both. That's right. Um, as far as the, the obviousness of it, I teach a class called reality 101, uh, at the university of Minnesota. And I almost called it the things you always knew, but didn't know you knew. Mm -hmm. Because it is obvious that we need energy for everything. It is obvious that fossil fuels are finite and we're drawing them down, yet our culture treats them as interest, not as a bank account that we're depleting. Mm -hmm. So um, our wealth is a product of our productivity, which is everything in our economic system. We come up with an idea and we use energy and materials to create an invention. And then we denominate it in dollars. So you said we're running out. We've been running out since the first well was drilled in 1859. I don't think we're actually going to run out in yours or my lifetimes or even beyond. What we're running out of is the amount at the scale that will power economic growth at an affordable level to people. Um, this morning's newspaper showed 20 million Americans are overdue on their utility bills. Oil's only $90 a barrel here. In Europe today, because of the Russian situation, um, natural gas is 600, uh, um, the equivalent of $600 a barrel of oil today. Wow. And German politicians are saying you might not need to shower hand cloths are good inventions you know those sorts of triage sorts of situations i think germany is and all of europe are are, is in a really difficult spot they're going to have to make choices of what to turn on what not so i think this is a kind of a wake-up call to the world that we live in an energy and material reality yet we have this cultural facsimile that it's a technology and money reality Mm -hmm. 